Hello, my name is Marie Alcock and it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Um, today's session is really going to go into the brain research background of what we're talking about. And part of what's so exciting about the brain is how complex it is. And just looking at some of these facts here, you can see that the human brain, um, which we previously thought was hardwired, is actually not. It um, grows and changes and develops over um, your lifetime. And what's so fantastic about that is the ability of the brain to develop new pathways, um, also known as neuroplasticity. And so part of why that's going to be excited or exciting for us is that as teachers and as educators, you and I can keep that in mind as we're working with children and helping them learn and grow, even when some of the things we think about the way we maybe traditionally or even habitually have done things like teach reading or teach mathematics, we can come at that idea in a different way and be more successful with more students and more learners. And this kind of knowledge is something I'm super excited to share with you. However, um, I'm gonna break it up, okay? So we're gonna start off and we're gonna have two stories for today. The first story is going to be about the brain science behind STEM. And we're gonna play with VUCA, right? And feel free to say that, VUCA, it's fun to say. And so we're going to spend a little time at looking at where we are as a profession, what is happening in our profession that is encouraging this kind of work, why there's so much money behind STEM, um, why it's such a buzzword right now, right? Everyone wants STEM. And the second story that we're going to go into is going to be focused on two types of learning brains. And we're going to look at how those two types of learning brains respond to unit design standards, all the work that we're doing ever since the 90s anyway, in that area. All right. So we're going to go two stories. So let's start with STEM. All right. Looking at this, um, the focus here, and if you want to learn more about it, look up the brain science behind human decision-making, okay? So, what's VUCA? VUCA comes from the U.S. Army War College, and what it represents is any idea or decision that is volatile, it is uncertain, it's complex and ambiguous. And so for us, this could be anything from the rise of artificial intelligence in society. Um, in a kindergarten classroom, it could be um, of the holidays or the definition of family. A VUCA topic is one that really, we used to be able to say, you know what, can we just agree to disagree, right? And then we go on and live our life happily. But what we are, are learning and what the U.S. Army War College was researching was there are some things in society or what you and I would call a complex society that we cannot just agree to disagree. Um, sometimes we have to make decisions. And not only that, but we have to make decisions in a society that is um, very complex. We have lots of different kinds of values, lots of different kinds of cultures, lots of different kinds of economies. And when you're in a situation like that, and in the United States specifically, we have um, a, a type of government, a representational government that shifts and changes its decisions um, every two to four years. Well, I mean, that's fine for some things, but for things that are VUCA and things that you cannot take back, okay? So for example, the rise of artificial intelligence. I can't say, oh, that's okay to go all in on that. And then eight years later say, oh, you know what? Stop all that. So in a complex society, sometimes we can't just agree to disagree. And we have to then be able to approach, discuss, 
and make decisions about VUCA topics. So the U.S. Army College, War College, um, and I'm going now 20 years back, determined that in the United States, if we do not learn how to, or we do not teach our children how to discuss and make decisions about VUCA topics that we as a government model will fall apart. And that is something that we need to be talking about. And it is why so much research went into the human decision-making process. And it's also the reason why you're hearing STEM. So let's talk a little bit about STEM. You've got STEM and then people are like, hey, it's STEAM and then it's STREAM. Well, actually the brain science behind it says it's STREAM. And what that means is it's really all of the content areas. And I'd like to show you in this model why. So what happens here is STEM started off and as uh, the U.S. Army War College was promoting, it starts off with humans. So sorry, social studies, you win. And the reason why they're in public education, there's funding for a public education in a representational government is basic literacy for all citizens, a healthy economy, and civics. Those were the topics until Sputnik went in the air and then we got science. But this structure is set. And so it starts with humans and human decision making. So if you and I look at humans and we're studying how in a complex society we interact, we move, information flows, that shows you patterns. And so probability and statistics, instead of just being a course maybe offered at the end of high school, you're going to notice probability and statistics standards are now all the way back through our math program. But probability and statistics leads us to questions worth studying. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I'm looking at a, an intersection and I notice that people, more people get injured at this intersection than this one. That's going, that's probability and statistics. I'm just looking at a pattern, <clears throat> but it leads me to the question, why are people getting hurt at that intersection? And the group of people in our society that looks at questions and at phenomena are scientists. And so science looks at questions. They don't actually solve problems. Scientists are interested in observations and trying to describe truth. So a success or a failure in an experiment to a scientist is a win either way. They're super happy because they're getting closer and closer to being able to, de to describe or answer that question, describe that phenomena or answer that question. But as scientists go through that process, they create moments or they reveal problems and challenges. And these problems and challenges in society get answered by engineers. And so engineers, my mother was an engineer and she would often do presentations trying to encourage people to become engineers. And she would always start off saying, an engineer by definition is a problem solver. That's what they do. And so when these challenges and problems are identified, people are getting injured at this intersection, engineers then start promoting solutions. They do experiments, they either make prototypes or presentations, and they will have solutions. But engineers tend to get emotionally connected or committed to their solution. So solutions have to be tested. And we end up having to make an argument about which solution should we decide to do, okay? So driving our arguments and impacting human decision-making um, is going to be a huge part of this cycle that we need to teach students so that we in a complex society are capable of making a better so uh, decision based on arguments as opposed to persuasives. That's what the U.S. Army uh, War College was determining, and that's why the um, the, the programs came into design to support STEM. 
It wasn't so we all got mechanical engineers and it's not about robotics and it's not about Legos. It's about overtly teaching this human decision cycle in a complex society and making sure that all of our students are fluent in this, able to participate in this, and then also trust this as a process. But there's more. So look at the triangle in the middle of our model here. So this triangle is referring to what you and I would call the triangle of power. The triangle of power says that impacting our decision-making process in a complex society is government and its relationship to business and its relationship to media. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is if two sides of the triangle gang up on a third, they can control it. So if media and government gang up together on business, can they impact that business? Yes, look at how Nike had to change how they made shoes. Or if government and business gang up together on media, can they control the messaging? Absolutely. Look at how whenever we say in journalism, follow the money, what is the source? You'll see that impact. And Finally, if media and business gang up on government, can, it, can they impact policy? Yes, they can, which is why if you look at all the research right now at looking at the United States government and saying, are we a meritocracy as opposed to a representational democracy, there's a lot of validity to that. So the idea here is how do you and I make a curriculum where we're teaching the future of America to be aware of this triangle and to be able to understand and participate so they don't become victims of the triangle. So this entire process and this entire need for a future generation to be able to make healthy decisions in a complex society is what has led to STEM. So when we talk about engineers, I think that there's been a huge misunderstanding in this and people go, oh my gosh, okay, so it's all about mechanical engineers and it's about the idea of um, electrical engineers or civic engineers. The single highest paying job in American society right now is finance. The second highest paying industry is media. And so what you're looking at is art and music and library being a media block. When you're talking about the impact of information that's spread through images, sound, and text, that's where the power of the sound bite comes. So please don't misunderstand this in terms of the magnitude of a, cur a curricular impact. But let's take a look at all the different kinds of engineers we have. I'm showing you this to understand every content area is a STEM content area. I dare you to be Beyonce today or Taylor Swift without a sound engineer. And that Tiffany blue ribbon is absolutely a color engineer. Look at what we have in terms of language engineers, transportation, rehabilitation, imaging, wood, telecommunications, social engineering. That's all about identity theft. So no way is STEM isolated just to my math and science and technology classrooms. And this is an area that once you see the brain science behind what's going on, you and I can make better decisions about how to work together as teams and to really look at how this is gonna impact our assessments and our curriculum, and even how we're gonna handle the instruction within our classrooms. So this is a slide I just wanna share with you to give you some ideas about different assessment options that you and I might be thinking about as we're trying to design a curricular and learning experience for these children and the future they're gonna be living in. And hopefully it's one with the government the way that you and I, um, not so much the actual politicians, but the idea of having a true representational democracy and understanding what that can be for us. All right.
that was story number one. Yay. You can pause right here if you want for the moment and say, hey, let's think about and talk about those ideas. But I'm going to go ahead and dive right in to story number two, which is going to be the brain science behind the actual learning that we're seeing and why curriculums are looking different and standards are looking different from the way they looked even maybe at the beginning of our careers. So here we go, a story of two brains. In terms of learning, there are really two fundamental kinds of brains. In an oversimplification, you and I can call them the spiderweb brain and the inchworm brain. A spider web web brain fundamentally is an analyzing brain, meaning as long as it has a comprehensive sticky hole to hang on to, that brain can connect seemingly disconnected little parts of information. It can pull those out and hold on to them, retain them, and work with them very competently. But that comprehensive whole has to be something that explains the why. So it's dependent on why am I learning this? Okay. And it'll organize all that information. In this way, a brain could learn about history in a thematic way. Let's study major effective uh, leaders. And I learn about um, Genghis Khan. I might learn about Um, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, and I might learn about Nelson Mandela. And this brain doesn't necessarily think that all four of those individuals lived at the same time and hung out together and had coffee together. It can understand the and hold on to the differences without even knowing the timeline, not even necessarily knowing what dates they existed. So I don't have to teach it in a linear progression I can teach and analyze, break out pieces of information as we go along. The other kind of brain is called an inchworm brain, also historically known as a linear brain or an academically inclined brain. Now for this one, I want you to think about how an inchworm moves. It moves in these little linear steps as it would work its way across the screen. And in doing that, it's almost like an inchworm picking up a breadcrumb trail small bits of information. And then it's a synthesizing brain. It combines them all together, makes connections, and has an aha moment. And so what this kind of brain is working with is the granular pieces of the what. What does the brain need to learn? What does the brain need to know or be able to do? And so you and I might call those those learning targets. And the brain would just sit there and put the pieces together until somehow it all comes together and makes sense. Okay. In general, the American education system historically has been partial toward the linear brain, which means when I'm working with a student and they are struggling, my normal prescription to help them is to break it down. Let me break that down for you, right? So there's this idea that if I keep breaking it down, that brain is going to be able to access the information. And this has led us to a world where we used to have only two types of nouns, and now we have something like 14 different kinds of nouns because we keep breaking it down to help it make more sense, okay? So This idea is one that I think you and I can understand when we look at our curriculum. We think there's a linear progression that has to be followed. Truth is actually, no. Uh, A human brain can approach any kind of learning as long as it has an understandable why, like an essential question, and an approachable accessible what, a learning target, the brain will be able to wrestle with the idea and retain it long term. Now, here's the problem. You can't sort your kids and go, okay, I want all my little spiderweb brains over here, and here's your essential question, and I want all my little inchworm brains over here, here's your learning target, I hope everybody's comfortable. The human brain, when they're learning, can shift right in the middle of a learning experience from one to the other. And there's actually a reaction, you can tell, there's a physical change in a human when they shift from the spiderweb brain to the inchworm brain or from the inchworm brain to the spiderweb brain. In short, there's usually like a, ah, oh my gosh, there's a voice, your temperature change, your temperature will rise and muscles constrict. 
maybe you've experienced that when maybe you're learning about a new idea and you're like, oh, I love that idea. I want to do what she's talking about or he's talking about. I have no idea where to start. What is the protocol that I should be following or the steps? Okay. That's someone who was spider web brain and totally now needs an inchworm support. The opposite goes like this. If I'm an inchworm and I'm I'm working on things, I'm filling in tasks, I'm filling in graphic organizers, I'm completing a task, but then I go, what? Why am I doing this? It feels like total compliance. Why on earth do I have to complete this task? That's an inchworm brain suddenly needing a spider web support. So what the research has shown us in the 1990s was all learning experiences should have immediate direct alignment access to essential questions, that's the why level, and learning targets or content and skills, which would be the what level. So if you picture any unit design, and I don't want to get lost in the weeds of whether it's understanding by design or international baccalaureate IB design or backwards design or universal design for learning, the brain science was all the same. It was this idea of why level and a what level. So the why aligning enduring understandings or teacher facing essential questions are for the students. And then the what level content and skills are for teachers. That's how you write a curriculum, but you combine them together in a learning target, which is an I can or an I will statement for students to be able to understand. And if I have this in my curriculum design, then students are going to be more successful. And not only that, more students are going to be more successful. So you and I could pretty much summarize all unit design structures this way. Standards have to have a why and a what. Unit plans have to have a why and a what. Curriculums have to have a why and a what. Lesson plans have to align to a why and a what. And my evidence, I need evidence of the why and I need evidence of the what to be explored a little deeper. This means if I were going to create my learning sequences, it would look like this. I would have two to five essential questions per six week unit. That's how Grant Wiggins or Jay McTie would say it. What I'm saying here is you really want to err on the side of less is more. It takes time to develop the answers to these essential questions. Now, if I have a really good essential question, so let's say for math, I have one. How can my knowledge of math help me make better decisions? All right. Well, that's a good question for a kindergartner, first, fifth, eighth, ninth, senior in high school, adult learner in mathematics. If I have that kind of range, and it could be in any unit, decimals, percents, ratios, geometry, measurement, you're not getting that couch inside that apartment if you don't do this. So I can be in any content um, unit of my mathematics sequence to answer an essential question like, how can my knowledge of mathematics help me make better decisions? Also notice the pronoun, it's me, not you. If it's you, the locus of control is in the teacher. All right, cool. So you know you have a good essential question if it starts to feel like it has that kind of range. It also means that essential questions are going to be repeated. They should be repeated at multiple grade levels and even within units. If it's so essential of a question, it should be returned to over and over again throughout my learning experience. Seriously, I'm thinking about like essential question journals or a portfolio where kids can see how their answers to these kinds of questions change over time. Fantastic. But to answer a question like that, I'm going to need supporting questions. Supporting questions align to the what. In other words, the learning targets, the content, the skill. What content from mathematics would a child need to learn in order to even think about answering the question about how math impacts better decisions. Well, let's look at money. So what is a percent? What is a decimal? How do I convert a percent 
to a decimal. How do I compare like decimals? All of those questions are fantastic supporting questions that are gonna help the student answer that essential question. Like, can you see the name of the unit? Deal or no deal, right? 70% off. Now, then I take each supporting question and I figure out how many lesson plans or how many activities do I need to teach to get the child to even be able to answer that supporting question, which then prepares them to answer the essential question. So essential questions are in effect an awful lot like a book, okay? And so um, essential questions might be the table of contents in my book. And every lesson or activity is a page within the book. And you don't get to have a chapter in a book called all the things I wanted to say but didn't fit into the table of contents or into the, right, the chapter headings. I have to curate my curriculum so that I have lessons that directly align to those essential questions. Otherwise, I need to challenge why am I teaching those lessons? And in the same way, I might have to change those lessons or I need better essential questions. So this is the structure we're going to to reduce the size of our curriculum and to make it better coherently aligned for the learner. Now, your standards are also, and all the standards written post 1997 also have this why and what structure that you and I just talked about for our curriculum. Every set of standards that you and I are working with in your district have a why level and a what level. Now the grade level standards tend to be the what level. They might be performance expectations. They might come in banded forms like K to two, three through five, like the C3 framework. But every single one of them align to a comprehensive brain development of a lens for looking at the world. For mathematics, that's mathematical practices of which there are eight. For literacy, they're the CLIs or the capacities of a literate individual of which there are seven. And for science, they're gonna be the cross-cutting concepts. These things represent how scientists think, whereas the DCIs represent what scientists know and the scientific practices represent what scientists do. So part of what you and I are doing in terms of school, this place called school in the United States, is we're trying to develop for the children fluency in their ability to look at the world through different lenses and be able to make different observations and ask different kinds of questions. So for example, if I'm going to be looking at this pen as a mathematician, what are the things I would notice or what are the questions I would ask? It might be, oh, how long is it? How much ink does it have left in it? But if I were to look at this pen as a scientist, what are the things I would notice and what are the questions I might ask? I might look at what were the materials used to make it? Are they sustainable? Um, did it impact an ecosystem? Is it something that is recyclable? If I were to look at this pen as a poet, what are the things I might notice and what are the questions I might ask? I might be noticing what color that the ink is and be thinking about the words that I could use to express different kinds of feelings or maybe the potential. Maybe I wanna make a metaphor about what this pen can represent in terms of language and communication to the kinds of things that I as a human experience. The point here is that kind of fluency to be able to shift in your brain, looking at the world through different lenses, doesn't need to memorize dates. It didn't need to do operations in um, solve problems. It didn't even need to know the history of my local town. It's this ability to interact with my immediate environment. And so that's a big part 
of well, what you and I are doing in curriculum now when we're not trying to sort children from the industrial era and more importantly, trying to develop talent um, to the highest level possible for all of our students. So every set of standards have this why level and this what level. To be clear, the why level is going to align to your essential questions. The what level aligns to your learning targets. Okay. So keeping that in mind, oh, sorry. Now it's trying to take me into the actual website. Let's try moving forward. Okay. So to do that, we're going to look at how to organize those standards in a structure. And this tool is going to be called a year-long context. So something to note on this, that a year-long context is not a curriculum. A year-long context is just a bunch of bundles of standards that have the why level and the what level of the standards. And it's um, anchored in a timeline, not in marking periods, not in units of curriculum, but in the timeline, the learning sequence that you and I have. So it would be different if we're a 10 month school or a year round school. So the requirements of a year long context are that they have bundles that have relationships to each other. So I can actually teach something and get evidence of the standards in a connected way. Um, meaning I could do one assessment and get evidence of several standards, for example, or do one learning experience and develop depth and range into um, more than one standard. You also want to have a balanced distribution of the standards, okay? I don't want to have too many standards in one spot. That starts to cease to be a useful document. Um, it has to include every single standard. So this is not an opportunity to prioritize certain standards that I'm going to teach these standards instead of other standards. We're not cutting any standards. That doesn't mean we're going to give equal time to every single standard. I'm not trying to say that every single standard is equal. What I am saying is that every single standard will be taught and developed, uh, will be demonstrated and gotten evidence of. Okay, so part of me also says here, you know what, only once. I don't need to see everywhere the standard happens. Otherwise, my ELA teachers are going to take all the standards, put them everywhere, not a useful document. We're also not talking about mastery. Otherwise, we take all the standards and put them at the end of the year, not a useful document. So we're really looking at a divide and conquer technique. We want to make sure every standard is in there at least once. Now, some of them are going to be there twice. Some standards have more than one part. There's going to be reasons to have them twice. But if you go for three or four times, call me, you need an intervention. And then lastly, you're going to see those mathematical practices or those capacities of a literate individual or those cross-cutting concepts that we mentioned earlier to represent the why level. Okay, why are these things so important? because curriculums are oversaturated. You and I have way too much curriculum to teach right now. So by using a year long context like this, I can almost use it like a sieve and everything in a curriculum that sticks to the year long context when that standard appears in the year long context can now become non-negotiable and everything else is now negotiable. That kind of clarity about the non-negotiables, what will get taught, when it will get taught, and what evidence I will get of that teaching is a relief to teachers. Otherwise, I feel like I have to do everything all the time. Teachers right now have way too much to teach, and they're starting. It's not good for their mental health, all right? Because how wonderful is it to end your year knowing you didn't get to everything, and so now I'm obviously bad at my job. That's not helpful. Or worse, I rushed through it. I know that's not best for learning. I know that's not best for kids, but I feel like I have to do that because I have an oversaturated curriculum. So the second real important reason here is that actually by being clear of the non-negotiables in a curriculum, knowing where I don't get to cut items, it actually gives me permission to have autonomy in the areas that I can cut consolidate, 
keep or even create new items. Teachers need to have that clarity. Where is consistency required for student success? Where is flexibility required for student success? By doing this, I'm going to be able to meet the needs of my students. And then last but not least, by having these agreed upon guaranteed viable elements of the curriculum, research shows that that is the number one way to um, improve student performance sustainably in more than, for more than three years. So a year long context, it's a tool for you and I to interact with our standards and then in turn crosswalk that with our curriculum resources. So here's an example. This is an example of a kindergarten math um, year long context. Just want you to notice that it has the standards separated out and Notice at the bottom, there are these mathematical practices. Every single standard is done at least once in bundles one, two, three, and four. And a couple of standards are repeated in that May sequence, and they're gonna be done in a completely different way. Also notice that um, some, I know like, look, let's look at January and February. They have an awful lot of standards there, but there are more weeks of instructional time in January and February than there is in November and December. To be, <laughs> to be clear, that last week in December is not the highlight of intellectual activity in most North American 10-month schools. So the other part of a year-long context is that it should feel wildly doable, okay? I take out all those weeks that are interrupted, that I have testing, that they have, um, that they might have vacations. And I know that I can actually teach, develop, and assess these standards during that time. This is an example of ELA. And for your purposes, just so you know, down here, there's an audio recording of the think aloud that the teacher went through to actually create this year long context. So what I mean by sharing that is every single standard is intentionally placed there. It's not just random, like spreading bird seed. There's a relationship, there are bundles so that standards that can be taught and assessed together are bundled together, thus increasing um, the ability to save time. All right, super cool. Let's go a little further now into uh, the idea of these stories. These stories have a relationship with one another where they're connecting these big instructional ideas like standards, curriculum, classroom instruction, and assessment. So the brain science behind them says, hey, we need to think about how this is being experienced by our learners, and that has to drive our decision making. To be clear, what I'm suggesting here is that you and I agree that anything you and I adjust about our curriculum or our instruction or our assessment is made for the student's comfort first and then adult comfort second. To be clear, I'm not anti-adult comfort. Obviously, I really want the faculty, administrators, and parents and community involved with the school to be comfortable. But when a decision is going to be at a tug of war, I need to prioritize the learner's comfort first and then adult comfort second. And if we can agree on that, that will help our decision-making process as we go through this. Which brings us to our last point, and this is where you as teams are going to pick up the work today. But we're going to talk about the relationship, and I'd like to calibrate our language between standards, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Okay, and I'd like to build an analogy to try and make it helpful. I find analogies are super helpful for um, learning material. So I'm going to share this one that I use with my graduate students to help you as you go forward as a district. So standards. Standards are consistent and they are the minimum expectations of what a student should learn, know, or be able to do. Standards are not a curriculum. So in our analogy, standards are more like building codes. Building codes are there for safety and consistency. So I might agree that outlets should be a foot and a half off the ground. 
because we want to make sure that we don't have too many um, consequences for regular flooding, right? Uh, an accident happens in a house and there's a flood. I need to make sure my outlets are a foot and a half off the ground. Research has shown us that that's the minimum to make sure that even if a pipe breaks, we don't end up with fires. Excellent. So standards say things like, um, you know, that we need to be able to know how to add and subtract fractions. They don't tell us how to teach that. They don't tell us what to connect that to. It's a minimum expectation at a certain grade level. Okay, so if that's for standards, then what's curriculum? Curriculum in this story is going to be a little more difficult because there is a consistent part of a curriculum and there's a flexible part of a curriculum, meaning I need to have intended curriculum. If I'm coming into a district and decisions have been made about the vertical articulation or decisions, decisions might have been made about how to connect to the local community, I can't just come in from wherever I was working before and bring that curriculum with me. I need to learn about the curriculum that's aligned to these students in this community. All right, super cool. So that's an intended curriculum. And for our school, that would be unit plans, okay? But in our analogy, it would be like a blueprint, like a blueprint for a building. It's my cunning plan. And this blueprint for my building is one that I could buy off the internet or I could go to a um, architect and say, hey, I have an idea for a building that I would like to build. So let's pretend I go to an architect and I'm like, oh, I would like to build a building. And they go, oh, that's fine and fantastic. Let's begin. And I go, well, I would like it to exemplify the standards or the building codes. The architect would be a little confused. What do I want? A room full of outlets? That doesn't make any sense. How could I design a building to be the minimum of the expectations? Well, in the same way, I can't design a curriculum to exemplify the standards. Standards are the minimums. Don't tell me that we are a minimum district. And in that same way, aiming for standard, that's not the goal, that's the minimum. Curriculums always go above standard. That makes sense, okay? I just need to be super clear about what the minimum is, and I need to make sure I don't let children have gaps in those minimum expectations. Meanwhile, the curriculum, that can knock it out of the park. There has to be a height, a rigor to that. And that's going to increase motivation. That's going to be able where I can say, how far can my students go? All right. So my blueprint is a unit plan. And it is the intended curriculum. Meanwhile, I have operational curriculum. An operational curriculum is what happens in a given year with a given group of students. And that's always going to be a little different. Uh, first of all, the identity of the students comes in. Whereas my intended curriculum had the identity of the teacher, the identity of the district, the identity of the community. This is where teachers are making choices. This is where teacher voice is. What mentor text do I use? What case study do I use? What example do I use to teach the material? That's the teacher identity. But in an operational curriculum, I got to meet the kids. Maybe they have gaps that need to be filled. Maybe they have other questions that's why we don't go to five essential questions right away, right? We have two to three. I want to leave room for the children in the curriculum. So they're going to co-create learning targets. They're going to co-create essential questions. That's going to be called the operational curriculum. And that really is curriculum data. So in our analogy, that's the actual building. So if you and I have the same blueprint, but I'm building on sand and you're building on granite, we're going to make timely decisions in the moment that results in a slightly different looking building. And it should. Every building made from the same building uh, blueprint does not look the same, doesn't have all exactly the same features. In the same way, you and I can have unit plans every year. And that's our curriculum. Okay, welcome to our district's curriculum. But when I go to a group of students that year, it's going to turn out a little different because of what's going on in the community, what's going on in our world, and the identity of the children. 
Now, instruction is utterly flexible. So whereas standards were consistent, curriculum had consistent and flexible, instruction is flexible. We've learned you can't say to a group of teachers, all of you have to be on page uh, 47 on Friday or you're fired, right? We've learned that over micromanaging that, or in other words, teacher proofing, doesn't work well. It's not best for teachers and it's not best for kids. So in our story, these are going to be our lesson plans. Now, lesson plans are different from unit plans, whereas unit plans have standards and essential questions and learning targets and assessments. Lesson plans have how I'm going to group the kids, pacing. They might have st starting questions, materials and resources. These kinds of tools align to either direct instruction, inquiry instruction, maybe demonstrations, presentations, questing that we might be doing, um, group work that we might be doing. So instructional choices are made in the moment. So for our analogy, let's say I have my blueprint and I go and I find a general contractor. If I identify a general contractor and I go, hey, I bought a piece of land. I'd like you to build this building. Please facilitate this project. And we have a timeline. Okay. I need this building built in about a year. Well, the general contractor says, okay, starts organizing vendors, organizing teams, putting materials together. But every day, that general contractor should be showing up and looking at the site. Well, if it rained last night, we're not going to be pouring concrete. It won't set. Even if in the original plans, that's what I wanted to do, I need to make daily building plans for all my teams to keep them busy. So we actually are still working toward our timeline. I can't just say, oh, no work today. Don't worry, guys. We'll get it done eventually. Can't do that. But I also need to respond to whatever the timely circumstances are. And if it rained, we're not pouring concrete. And if my steel crew has the flu, we're not cutting steel today. So that kind of professionalism to be able to make the right call in the right moment that those learners need that's what lesson plans are about, and they change every year. Unit plans can be consistent. Lesson plans are responsive. Okay, so that takes us to dun, 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 assessment. What's up with assessment? Well, I can't just have one kind of assessment be evidence of all these things, and I think that's been a big misunderstanding in the field of education. So, we're going to create some language here for us. We're going to have bucket one assessments, bucket two assessments, and bucket three assessments. Let's play it out. Bucket one assessments are evidence of standards. Bucket two assessments are evidence of curriculum. And bucket three assessments are evidence of instruction. I'm trying to avoid any kind of misunderstandings that happen with formative, summative, diagnostic, different kinds of language like that. So let's take a look. Assessment evidence of standards, bucket one assessment items, tend to be boring. They're very simple. They're overly sterilized. They're very precise. They are there for diagnosis and prescription. They can be common assessments. They can be comparable assessments. But the heart of the matter is they are evidence of the minimum. So they're making sure our students don't fall through a gap. They have to be short, quick to give, quick to score, quick to give back. You're in total pursuit of feedback to the learner, which is vital for them to, to grow and to close their own gaps. Okay, so bucket one assessment items are always evidence of standards. Bucket two assessment items, though, oh man, they get to be evidence of the curriculum. And they are evidence of identity. The identity of our school. Remember what I said about the identity of the teacher, the identity of our community, and ultimately the identity of our students. So these get to have the coolest words like joyful, career, making the world a better place, meaningful, worthy learning experiences. Man, whenever you and I get to talk about bucket two assessment items, they're just awesome. They're all those PBLs we talk about, project-based learning, problem-based learning, phenomenon-based learning. Apparently all cool methods begin with the letter P. Who knew? But in this piece, 
you and I are really pursuing the top. These are assessments that are gonna push our students to really experience the highest level of a learning experience they can. And we are not gonna try and diagnose whether each student can individually do each standard at a diagnosis and prescription level out of an experience like that. Have you ever tried? Did you ever do like a major project like that and go, oh, I'm going to now see if every single standard that I was looking for individually happened here. That's a weekend of your life you will never get back, okay? So we need to have two different kinds of assessment designs. One for diagnosis and prescription and evidence of standards to make sure we don't have a gap at the bottom. We also need a design for a meaningful, worthy, joyful learning experience that represents as high as we can go. And this should be rigorous, but don't try to make both of those assessments be the same event. That is absolutely going to sabotage both purposes. Now, I also need to have assessment evidence of instruction. And so what that's going to look like is a self-navigation tool. It's also gonna be evidence of engagement. To be clear, I don't mean it's proof of instruction. This isn't where I'm gonna say, hey, turn in all your lesson plans. I need to see that you did instruction. We know that you're doing instruction. But this is where we say that teaching is an invitational art. And what do we mean by that? We mean teachers create the conditions of success. But to what extent that child accepts the invitation and engages with the learning is going to impact how far they're able to go. And so you and I could be the most dynamic teacher with a passion that makes Marzano weep for joy. But if the child doesn't engage, we're not going to get as far as we'd like to. So you and I are going to talk about how do we assess engagement? And to some extent, it's going to be the answers to the questions that a child can give you when they say, what am I learning? Do they know the learning target? Why am I learning it? Do they know the essential question? How am I learning it? Do they know what learning strategies are, do, are happening? There's only 16 learning strategies the human brain can experience. Which one is the student using at that time? How will I know if I've learned it? That's going to align to the criteria for success. If the child knows what the criteria for success is, then they can self-assess. And that's the beginning of becoming a self-navigating learner. And the last one is, how do I feel about what I'm learning? We know that that social emotional engagement is going to be connected to long-term retention. And in that space, if the child says, I love it, this is so meaningful, it could happen, then that's fantastic. They're likely to retain the material longer. And even if they say, this was horrible, this was so hard, this was the hardest thing I've ever done, I've struggled through this whole process, that is also an emotion and they will retain the material. Apathy is the tool of forgetting. You and I have to declare war on apathy in our classrooms. That's where we're losing this idea of engagement. So using that structure for framing the learning and having it connect to a self-navigation tool where those learning targets align to learning strategies, individualizing this piece so students can actually learn how to be self-navigating learners, you got yourself evidence of instruction. So just to be clear, the foundation of what you and I are going for self-navigation is going to be a four-part piece, what you and I are going to call the four selfies. Their ability to self-assess, their ability to self-regulate, right, or self-monitor, and that's about looking in the past. What have I done? What am I good at? What do I need to practice? What do I still need to learn? Notice the pronoun is I. Self-directing behaviors is in the brain thinking about going forward. What are my goals? How will I practice? How will I learn? How will I improve my performance? And it's about goal setting. And then the last one is about self-motivation. What we've learned about the human brain 
is that wanting good grades or wanting to keep my parents and my teachers happy, uh, wanting to graduate doesn't motivate to action. It actually motivates to fantasy. To motivate a child or to teach a child how to self-motivate to action, the task must be doable. They must believe it is doable. So you and I now know that that's why essential questions have to be student facing. They have to be approachable and accessible. And learning targets have to be student facing, meaning the student understands them. The I pronoun, I, me, we. It also needs to be understandable, approachable and accessible and not too many. It can't be intimidating. The minute the brain thinks the task is too hard, then what happens is the brain will disengage from it and go, well, I didn't want to do it anyway. Well, I guess there's a whole series of careers I will never go into. And so in order to get motivation, you and I need to make sure that our curriculum is approachable, accessible, and the student believes it's doable. And it's okay to go ahead and ask them. They'll tell you if it feels doable or not. So working off of this is where you are going to be starting off and building into the next pieces of the work you're doing for the next couple of years. Woohoo! All right. So technically, this is just a slide that shows you the analogy that I just went through. I'm trying to differentiate it for all the different adult learners we have in the audience. Um, looking at that, I am committed to continuing to help you, and it's been an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. But what I do want to do is share with you a little bit of an epilogue. So I know that you and I just went through, you know, an hour long keynote and part of what, and I'm hoping that during that time, you were able to pause and stop and turn and talk to one another and discuss. So really, I know it's like an hour and 40 minute keynote, but one of the things that I want you to uh, explore together with your partners are these um, additional resources. So everything I just said, there's a little sub video where you can now look at maybe a different perspective of it and go through those um, details you and I just talked about. The standards, the product is the year long context. The curriculum, the product is the unit plan and then the actual curriculum. The idea of the, uh, um, the instruction going to be the lesson plans and the idea of the assessment is going to be this idea of um, the standards, assessment evidence of standards might be a standardized test. The assessment evidence of the curriculum might be a project and the assessment evidence of the instruction is going to be that self-navigation tool. For the analogy, the assessment evidence of the building codes might be when a state inspector comes to inspect a hospital and just makes sure that the outlets are a foot and a half off the ground. They're not interviewing people and seeing if the hospital is meeting all of their needs. They're not going in and saying the cardiac unit is the best possible it can be. They're just doing a state inspection. It's relatively boring. But the assessment of curriculum analogy, hospitals, they go and if a cardiac unit wants to get certified, they reach out to other hospitals who have very similar purposes and they will come in and say, hey, let's inspect your cardiac unit and we'll give you feedback and notes about how your cardiac unit is doing. And so that's the similar kind of assessment as to what you and I are doing with projects. And then the assessment evidence of instruction for our analogy might be like a suggestions box maybe. So I'm getting information from everyone who's visiting the hospital and getting what their personal experience when they engaged with my building was like for them. I'm not gonna change everything about my building for each piece, but I am gonna be looking at that trend data and I'm gonna try and meet the needs of them individually if I can. Oh, nope, we're not gonna actually watch the video. Here we go. So this is a resource for you that just shows a write-up of each of those things I just said, and we'll walk you through examples of them in case in my keynote today, maybe I skipped a part or I missed a part in the story. I wanna make sure that you have access to all those pieces individually when you review it. These next three slides are the methods of creating a year long context. Now I gave you an audio of one person's think aloud as they went through the process. But honestly, one way to do it is to take your standards, cut them up, and look at how they bundle together. 
It's a completely legit way to go through the process and really get to know your standards. Another method is to just use a digital tool like the grids that I was showing you and just lay them out with the codes. This should feel doable. This is also another way to approach a teacher's mental health about what they're doing when they're planning and facing um, meeting all these standards. Back in the 90s, we used to say, oh my gosh, there's so many standards and they can just be so overwhelming. I can't possibly teach them all. That was something we used to say. That's not true anymore. We have 32 standards in ELA, on average 27 standards per year in math. We got this. We're a bunch of adult educators. We can handle this. And I think looking at it this way, maybe in a digital um, grid, can help us see that and feel a little bit more comfortable with the process. And right now, we are very committed to helping teachers feel comfortable with the process. A third way, and one that you will have access to as you go into Rubicon, is to put it into a software and start looking at printouts that you can look at and really see and plan out the entire year. When we get hired to write curriculums for districts, you're looking at something like 90 to 120 to 180 lesson plans. Think about it that way. Don't look at a giant textbook and say, oh my gosh, I need to go through all this, or a giant program. Those programs are oversaturated. So take a deep breath in, oh man, uh, deep breath out, and realize the scope of what you're looking to do, the minimum expectations of what you need to do, then how you're going to connect this in meaningful, joyful ways with your learners. And I think that that's going to help all of us really enjoy teaching again and connecting with the passions that we have about learning experiences. Okay, and last but not least, this piece is super important for really understanding the standards that we have and why we have them. I don't know how much uh, support or background you have personally had in why your standards look the way they do or where they came from. So I'm going to try in five minutes to do a TED talk on the history of standards, but I've also written it out here and I've shown lots of, I also have another video of a version of it if you have time and different resources that connect to the story I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> but I'm going to hit pause here because I don't want that video to play right now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of standards in the United States um, and where we come from with it. When the United States started its education system, I'm going way back now to when uh, we transitioned into a representational government, there was funding. It was felt that it was very important that public education exist that provides literacy, so we have a base literacy rate, mathematics, so that we have a healthy economy, and civics. And that was pretty much it. Everything else was done as you know, an extra piece of research. There were no grades. There were no sorting of kids by age. Seriously, I want you to think like Little House on the Prairie and the Waltons and things like that. Single room schoolhouse, people come in and they learn until they can hit their proficiencies, right? So they learn how to read and write, they learn how to do mathematics, and they learn civics. And then they can stop going to school. <clears throat> Certain students were identified and encouraged to go to what you and I would call middle school or high school. That was kind of invitational. They would take a test for it or they had to be given a letter of recommendation to go. And so those children went on to academia and they were encouraged to maybe go into higher education at which point all of that was private. Okay, so that's really what we were when we were an agricultural system, which is also why we have a 10 month program now. It wasn't until um, the 19th century, around 1890, where we shifted as a country and went, we need to design a school that, a system that would prepare kids for the future. And the future at that point was really the industrial era. And so we realized, I mean, you have to think about it. Back in the agricultural system, one town like um, Stanford would have a completely different time. It might be two o'clock, whereas in um, Stratford, it might be 11 o'clock in the morning. And it didn't matter that we had totally different times. 
we didn't have to have all our towns have the same time until trains. When trains were connecting town to town, suddenly it mattered when that was supposed to be happening. And so seriously, school, kids just arrived whenever they felt like it. Teachers arrived whenever they felt like it. There was nothing consistent or standardized about school. So for the industrial era, industrialists were like, we need our workers. If I'm going to set up mass production and interchangeable parts and I'm going to have um, a conveyor line, I can't have some people showing up when they feel like it. I need everyone to show up at the same time. So it was decided that school was going to be the place that really worked to train an entire generation to thrive in the industrial workforce. And this is where we got, you arrive at the same time, you leave at the same time. There are bells that go off that tell you when you need to move to the next section. 45 minutes, 90 minutes, even every week, having the same sort of instructional uh, schedule, there's no brain science that supports that. That is totally industrial. And the idea of we all eat lunch at the same time, totally industrial. Uh, grouping kids by age, totally industrial. Having all the same classrooms be the same size with the same number of desks and the same number of chairs, totally industrial. The whole idea of graduation being at a certain time, industrial. And the idea of sorting children, A, B, C, D, F. Sorting kids, um, the management from labor, the idea of a punitive scale. So this is when we started using the 100-point scale. And that was just to have not too many students accidentally succeed. That was what the 100-point scale was all about. And averaging grades, which was only designed to penalize children who took longer to learn. All of those techniques came out to, to meet the needs of the industrial era. Now, then, as we got into the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, we started to really look at and challenge this idea of disciplines, having multiple disciplines to learn, maybe how to educate the entire child or what else was involved in the institution of education. And that's when first standardized tests started to come out because back in the agricultural era, less than 18% of the U.S. population went on to middle school or high school. It was at this time that the schools started to look at um, higher grades and looking at even who would go on to those private institutions, and they wanted to have tests for that. The first standardized test for college was in 1906. As we started to look at um, education as we went through the 40s and 50s, <clears throat> you started to look at challenges and into the 60s of making sure we're educating every single child, which we still don't do and we've never done well. But this conversation started to um, grow in our population. When Sputnik went into the air, boop, 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 scared the bejesus out of us, we realized, oh my gosh, we need standards. And the first set of standards we had were ridiculously easy. I'm talking about we promoting kids for breathing. But it was this idea of, oh, we need science. We need more focus on math, less on the wellness of the child, but more about back to this focus on academia. And two great myths came out of American education right after 1961. One, homework means rigor. And number two, learning should make us sad and hard and crying that this idea that, oh, if your kid is joyful or having fun, must not be hard enough. All right, so then as we move on with that piece, um, we end up going into the 1970s. And in the 1970s, there's a huge change. We get truancy officers for the first time. So prior to this moment, it was very normal for people to say, oh, I got a third grade education or, oh, I got a sixth grade education. And they dropped out when they wanted to then go into the workforce. The 1970s, the system said, all children have to go to school, so no parents, you can't send your kid to work. And this was also in direct opposition to child labor uh, practices um, and to try and protect children from child labor and say, nope, 
They belong in school. They deserve access to school, which is another different kind of idea that came out of the 70s. And so now every single child needs to be experiencing these liberal art curriculums. So in other words, learning every single thing. And in the 1980s, there was a huge push to say, let's really help kids meet these goals. So we wanted students to stay in school up to at least eighth grade. And there was a lot of exploration into this idea of what middle school was. And so you get like athletes coming on TV saying, be cool, stay in school, right? And we really wanted to get kids to at least stay in school till eighth grade. That had never been done before. And by the end of the 80s, we were really seeing kids almost like entering high school. They didn't graduate from high school, but they were entering high school. And so that became a big push for us as we get, got into the 90s. <coughs> Excuse me. As we enter into the 90s, we're really looking for... When we got into the 90s, we were really looking for students to stay in high school. So graduation rates started to become a focus. Just to be clear, as we went into the 70s, less than 50% of the US population graduated from high school. So for us to be looking at almost 70 to 80% of our student population entering high school as we got into the 90s, was a huge amount of growth. And beyond that, almost 30% of the US population was entering some form of college as we were entering the 70s. In the 70s, there was a huge push for public colleges, public universities. You're gonna see a growth between the 1950s and the 1970s of these public institutions. Prior to that, Higher education in the United States was completely private. And so there was this joy in saying, hey, maybe there are more opportunities that we can get at this higher level of education. So <clears throat> what you're starting to see, though, is then as more students were looking to maybe consider something in that post high school experience, this growth of standardized tests to come in and start saying, hey, who gets to go to what schools? And the private universities put together the college board to try and make tests that would sort the students. Very industrial era. One more point. Remember those easy standards we had back when Sputnik went up in the air? Well, in the 80s, there was a new growth of thinking in education, which was if you have high expectations for students, they will meet them. So we rewrote all the standards to show higher expectations. And we had really hard standards. And that's when we got that attitude of, there are too many standards and they are way intimidating, can't possibly teach them all. <clears throat> and then the 90s happen. And in the 90s, a couple of major things occur. You've got us really going after um, a, a response to a nation at risk and a nation still at risk. You also have the United States participating in the TIMS and the PISA. The TIMS, the T-I-M-M-S, is the Science and Mathematics Assessment International. And the PISA, P-I-S-A, is the uh, Linguistic or Literacy Assessment for the International. And a couple of things occurred at that. And the final element with the 90s is it was the decade of the brain. We learned more about how human beings learn in the 1990s than ever. And so right after we rewrote all those standards in the 80s, we realized at the end of the 90s, oh my gosh, we're going to have to rewrite all those standards again based on the brain science. Also at that time, this, uh, there's a group called the CCSSO who had to um, answer to uh, our society about why um, we're not doing so well internationally. But let's talk about how we were doing. It's not that we were ranked so terrible at, you know, we've ranged between 23rd to 28th on the TIMS and the PISA. 
The real issue is that we were, oh, I apologize. We were um, spending more per student than the other top 29 countries around us combined. So the idea was for that kind of money, shouldn't we be number one? And so that became one of our goals out of goals 2000 was to be number one. But what we learned was, <clears throat> where's the money? The money wasn't in uh, administrative or teacher salaries or rents or pencils. The United States is not one country. We are 50 little countries when it comes to education. Every single state was maintaining its own set of standards and its own testing company. Do you know how much New York spends on the Regents? How much Massachusetts spends on the MCATs? Texas spends on the Teaks? Um, so the idea of every single state maintaining, regulating, running, and distributing, and checking reliability and validity of these standards and assessment programs <clears throat> all got added up into our per student's uh, expense. When you compare us to Germany or to the Philippines or Singapore, you're comparing us to one set of standards and one test. And so when we realized we had to rewrite all the standards, <clears throat> the CCSSO got together and said, tell you what, let's write one set of standards and the understanding will be that they'll be brain-based and all the states can then add to them and change them 15% and we'll give them to everybody for free. And then we'll create two testing options, PARC and Smarter Balance. PARC being more um, traditional, Smarter Balance, also the name of a butter and a dog food. I got nothing for you on that. But this one being a little bit more progressive and let states pick. And we'll call it Common Core. It was one of the most misunderstood initiatives as that came out. And it was never supposed to be used for teacher evaluation. It was never supposed to be used for grouping of students. And it was never supposed to be used to get a national curriculum or get everyone on the same page at the same time in any kind of overly regulatory vision. It was meant to save us money and get that money back into the districts and to stop the humiliation of how much we're spending per student um, on that international um, stage. So put all this together and now you have an understanding that your standards are all now brain-based as long as they're after 1997, that they're there to really give us a minimum expectation. It's not to over-regulate curricular choices. They don't tell you how to teach it. And they don't even tell you what to teach in terms of your themes or case studies or issues or challenges you want to put down for the kids or topics. It has those minimum expectations. Everyone has to learn how to add and subtract fractions and understand percents so that we have a healthy economy here in the United States. So this idea, I hope, is helpful to you. And these resources giving you a little bit more information about uh, the background of the brain science. Not only that's been there helping us all throughout the history of the United States, but ultimately now as we approach STEM and the human decision-making process in the contemporary modern United States as we are looking at the most complex society with information spreading very quickly and that access to accurate information or conflicting information requires us now to be able to comprehend as well as critique, to be able to make good arguments, check sources, be independent in our thinking, understand other cultures and perspectives, be able to use digital tools strategically and capably and to value evidence, to be able to meet the needs of different audiences and different tasks and purposes with our ability to communicate, think, and take action. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for the time that you've given me here. I want to thank you for the hard work that you do and for the service that you give all of our students and all of our learners. If you want more information, please reach out to me, Marie Alcock, and to Learning Systems Associates. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.